in the western coast of Africa, where silver and gold have become common features of nature's store. There are stories and legacies of lives that are yet more precious and unique. If the amazing Islamic empire of Sokoto was a crown of northern Nigeria, then Nana Asma'u was one of his most precious jewels. Nana Asma'u bin Shehu Uthman Danfodio was of noble lineage and distinctive rank. Her father was the founder and the magnificent ruler of the Islamic Empire of Sokoto. She became the epitome of true scholarship and intellectual brilliance, a product of her father's lifelong mission to promote education and enlightenment for men and women in society, at a time when the ruling class misappropriated and monopolized knowledge and education. Asma was born a twin to her brother Hassan. The year was 1793. Her name is derived from Asma bint Abu Bakr, the illustrious daughter of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam's closest companion and supporter, Abu Bakr Siddiq. The proud daughter of a great leader and intellectual whose brilliance and tireless struggle against ignorance became proverbial. Nana Asma'u was the product of her father whose objective as a ruler and empire builder was to advocate for the education of women and the weak in society. His daughter's biography and legacy is a testament to his success. Nana Asma'u was a gifted poetess, an erudite scholar, a prolific author and educator, as well as an activist and a community leader. In the year 1799, the five-year-old Asma'u had begun attending one of the local schools that was founded by her father. The school was quintessentially African, with little boys and girls busy transcribing verses from the glorious Quran onto little wooden tablets with black ink made from vegetable resin. The walls were made from mud brick and the sunlight trickled through and illuminated the space for the young students of knowledge. Sheikh Usman Danfodio was a very caring and attentive father to his children. He had popularized the advancement of education in general and the female education in particular, citing the gross abuse of power which was gained and monopolized by men of distinction through the privilege of education. As was customary in the household of Nana Asma'u, she would wait outside her father's room, ready for when he returned from lecturing and leading the prayers for the congregation in the mosque. And as per his custom when arriving home, he would entertain his sons and daughters in conversation. The daily school activities would be inspected and Asma'u would read out the contents written on her tablet, word for word, as her father listened to her attentively and carefully. This daily communion between father and daughter would be consummated in prayers and blessings upon the little girl before she would finally be granted leave to join the women folk and partake in the family meal. Her intellect was vast and profound, demonstrated by the ease and fluency with which she would speak classical Arabic, Hausa and Fulani dialects. In times of peace and reconciliation, her wise counsel and mastery of political strategy repeatedly benefited the rulers of Sokoto. Asma'u came from a family of scholars whose aim was to spread knowledge. We have her works, but the works of her sisters and cousins remain unpublished, untranslated, and in jeopardy, 
as the original manuscripts sit on shelves in the family home. Asma'u was a scholar, a poet, and a teacher. She used intellect and scholarship to create poetry. She used poetry to teach. She used teaching to inspire scholarship and poetry in others. We would all do well to follow her example. Education, teaching, and the pursuit of wisdom form the global constant in the life of Nana Asma'u. But her challenge, and that of many cultured and educated leaders in history, was to discover the most appropriate and effective way of bridging the gap between a meaningful education and the masses of people who made up society. It was during the Caliphate of Muhammad Bello, her brother, that the foundations of this new system were established. Concerned and apprehensive about the prevalent conditions of common women in her society, many of whom were married early and subject to decades of domestic servitude and oppression at the hands of male relatives, Nana Asma'u, like her father before her, objected vehemently against the clear misapplication of the prophetic tradition in regards to the rights and responsibilities of women, especially those that had been committed to the institution of marriage. And of great concern was the normalization of female illiteracy and the prevalent notion that a woman's service unto her husband was the only real function of her existence, ignoring the fact that Islam emphasizes the spiritual and moral responsibility of both genders in equal and due proportion. From her scholarly perspective, she who is responsible before God must also be empowered and enabled to fulfill that responsibility by means of education, culture, enrichment and dignity. This conviction was not resigned to the fleeting moments of passion or empty visions of a society that only exists in the utopian romantics of poets and dreamers. Quite to the contrary, Nana Asma'u was a woman of rank and status, but perhaps more importantly, she was pragmatic and courageous enough to leverage her influence and position to empower the women in her society, many of whom were deprived and detached from formal means of education. The system of education she subsequently pioneered took the form of a grassroots movement wherein she would organize villages and gather local women under the leadership of an appointed female supervisor and teacher that came to be known by all as a Jaji. The growing number of women associations headed by the Jaji came to be known as Yantaru. Nana Asma'u's system favored women who were at high risk of neglect and maltreatment in society. Among the most vulnerable were widows, divorcees, and prepubescent girls between the ages of 8 to 12 years old. They were the most suitable recruits as they had less restrictions to travel and were less likely to be constrained by household responsibility in contrast to married women. However, it was also important to ensure that divorcees, widows, and underage girls received an adequate education to prepare them for a more independent and dignified presence in society. Asma'u's relationship to the world involved her constant recommendation of spirituality through the use of the intellect. And she was practical. Her poetic topics included outrage at political or military injustices, instruction in practical matters, histories of the Prophet Muhammad and of her own time. Asma'u's eulogies of both women and men never ever mentioned an individual's worldly status, title, or power. Eulogies only spoke of an individual's ethical qualities, kindness, generosity, fairness, Asma'u's poems were composed in the language that suited the audience in keeping with the Prophet Muhammad's advice that the teacher should teach to the level of the student. 
For example, her brief work on the Quran includes in just 60 lines the name of every one of the 114 chapters of the Quran. She wrote it in full, full day first, testing it out on her family. And then in Hausa, the language of the masses who needed most to learn about the Quran during the re-socialization years after the wars. Long years later, she wrote it in Arabic, perhaps for her colleagues with whom she corresponded across the Maghreb as far away as Fez, Morocco. Knowledge and literature were transmitted through the medium of poetry, rhyming couplets, and litanies that would be rehearsed and memorized as part of the learning process. The prescribed curriculum was designed by Nana Asma'u, and the number of her manuscripts served as a foundation for many of the subjects taught and memorized by the women. The commitment required for this newly established organization to take root and flourish was very demanding and required both physical and intellectual fortitude. The young Taro were accustomed to traveling from village to village, trekking through bushes across rivers, both in the heat of summer and under heavy torrential rains. The women were also exposed to predators and poisonous insects out in the wilderness. However, the drive to spread knowledge and to socialize women fortified their hearts and minds. Old and young women alike would participate in these field trips. However, it was the youngest members who carried the community's hope for the future, and Nana Asma'u would often pray for their success. As for the social impact and services rendered by the Yantaru to the communities and villages in which they operated, these included delivering newborn babies, washing the bodies of dead women, cleaning the mosques, teaching children how to read and write Arabic, counseling women about marital affairs, and instructing them how to perform their prayers properly. Nana Asma'u paid careful attention to the well-being and development of her students. She would also use her close relationship with her brother, Caliph Muhammad Bello, to raise awareness about the general plight and needs of women folk within the cities and villages. Once a student became familiar with the system of learning and was qualified in the various branches of knowledge encompassed by the Yantaru, each student would be eligible to graduate and participate in a ceremony called Nadi. The newly qualified student and soon to be instructor would be handed a red cloth to tie around her head covering. This red ribbon signified her initiation into the ranks of the judges, thus entitling her to transmit her learning onto other students. Nana Asma'u succeeded in creating a golden chain of transmission that propagated and multiplied the stock of knowledge and sciences among women folk. The system and growing network of teachers she had engineered was organic and culturally appropriate within the villages and cities in which the lives of women were being enriched and transformed through the agency of education and culture. A mother to her students and a caregiver for her society, Nana Asma were engaged directly with and contributed towards the advancement and well-being of her people. Nana Asma was a polyglot, a polymath, and one who had the ability to write and lecture on many diverse topics from various dimensions, be they spiritual, historical, literary, political, medical, or emotional. Her charisma and wisdom earned her a central role in the Caliph's administration and political cabinet. Once described as the woman who stitched the world together, her negotiation and restorative qualities helped her bridge the gap between the ruling class and the overwhelming mass of uneducated and underprivileged women and men. It was her custom to maintain correspondence with other female scholars as far off as Morocco, while also collecting rare manuscripts from the East, which she would then simplify and translate for the benefit of her local students. Nana Asma'u also used her vast knowledge and comprehension of religion 
to educate women about the faith. She would explain to them the history of Islam from its earliest sources and earliest days. She then wrote detailed poetry on the articles of faith and the principles of religion in simple and relatable verses that were memorized and rehearsed by women both young and old. Then Asma lived a long and blessed life. She passed away in the year 1864. She was buried beside the resting place of her father, the great Shehu Usman Danfodio.